Absolutely. Let's start off with a little bit of an introduction by yourself because I don't think a lot of people are too familiar with you. I mean, Mike, Mike Ifritel, who hooked us up, by the way, so thanks, Mike, if you're watching. But Mike is very prolific on Facebook and other social media. You not so much, so tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Yeah, right on. I usually get tagged in all of Mike's like Facebook rants, so I'm just that like weird guy that he knows. Um, but uh, I, uh, my, so my name is Dr. James Hoffman. I have a PhD in sport physiology, uh, and the reason why Mike and I ended up hooking up is because we went to school together at East Tennessee State University. So we both did our PhDs there with Dr. Mike Stone, and so him and I overlapped for a couple of years, and so I got hooked up with him, and at first I started off as an RP client. We did um, some mass phases, some cutting phases, and that's where all those like pictures of me uh, that are on the internet came from. And then uh, Mike said, hey, you know, you kind of got the swing of things, and we have the same you know, educational background. Do you want to come in on as, as a client? And I said yes, and it's been really awesome ever since then. So it's been really great being a part of RP and being able to put a lot of good information out there and working with Mike and Nick. And now we have, like, I think we have, like, 10 other consultants, all who have, like, PhD-level education. So it's, it's really fun. It's really cool to work with a really, like, smart, intelligent group of people and get to do a lot of fun stuff in the field, too. So it's not just all – academics and boring and number crunching. It actually is like really fun. We get to go out and talk to people who are doing weightlifting or CrossFit or rugby or powerlifting or bodybuilding, whatever. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Yeah, I can imagine. And there's a lot of smart people on the Renaissance for sure. Uh, but what about yourself? Are you like a powerlifter, weightlifter? Do you just like to lift for, for what? Right now, I just, I'm just like a glorified bro. I've been a rugby player for a long time, and unfortunately, like when I got to do grad school, I had to kind of give that up, so I've kind of retired from rugby. I do the what we, we call the old boys thing in America, where we play once a year at our old school, and we brag about how awesome we used to be, and we drink beer, and, but that's about it. I don't really do much sports outside of that now. I've picked up like kickboxing, but mostly I just train to, for myself and to look good naked, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the best reason, basically, right? I right. mean, <laughs> exactly. There's nothing wrong with that. Why not? And and to be honest, I I almost saw you naked of uh, those pictures of Run Sun Spiritization. You you look pretty, pretty good, uh, James. Uh, <laughs> what's up with that? <laughs> Thanks. It was pretty close. I mean, I wish my skin wasn't so fluorescent. I think I have like this bioluminescent thing because I'm so pasty. But yeah, it was pretty darn close to naked. Every now and again, a student will will be like, "Is this you?" And I'll be like, "Ooh, yeah, that's me." Um, <laughs> you're not supposed to see that, I guess, but whatever. So <laughs> you didn't yeah. get into trouble yet. Like, I don't know, certain female teachers that get into trouble because they like making certain type of <laughs> movies. No, no, it was nothing like that. And I don't think, I don't think it'll, I don't think it's an issue like that. It was just a <laughs> progress picture kind of thing. It ended up being really cool. And, and, uh, you know, I, I was glad to be a part of RP when it was kind of still young and developing, and I think some, some of my contribution helped out with that, and now I get to help out in another way, which is helping other people reach their goals, which is really fun. Yeah, I, it's really cool. And can you tell us a little bit more about your transformation? I mean, did my yeah. core shoot to lose weight or first to gain? <laughs> yeah, so at first it was uh, – I did the mass phase first. So I started off around like uh, around 215 pounds. Uh, it was kind of normal body comp, and so we did a – a really structured mass phase, I got up to just under 250 pounds over about three months or so, maybe a little bit longer, maybe three or four months. And so at that point, I was like really big, and that was the biggest I'd ever been. And Mike likes to make fun of me because I was eating like twice as much fat as I was supposed to, and I was complaining about it. So I got my serving size. I made the same mistakes that a lot of our clients make when I was first started. So, you know, I was eating like way too much, and I was complaining about it. And so, you know, when you get really big like that, when you put on like 30, 40 pounds, it's not the most pleasant thing. There was a couple times where I would take a cardio walk and go to failure. I had never walked to failure in my life before. I was just so big. I was like, ugh. I'm over it. So. <laughs> Excuse me, but but how long does it take for you to go to fill here in cardio? I mean, once uh, flight of stairs or? <laughs> yeah, I was I was walking around my neighborhood and my calves were just so cramping from from walking from being so big. I had to stop and I was like, I have walked to failure. This is an all time low. Um, so right around that point is when I was like, okay, time to time to cut back down again. And so. The, the first cut phase, we did about four and a half months, I think, and we just, you know, did it real slow at a time. We lost about one to two pounds per week, uh, got me down to about 215, I think, uh, and then we took a pause. We did the maintenance phase and just hung out for about a month, 
kept my weight nice and steady. It helps give your give yourself a little mental break, a little physical break, and it helps kind of give your metabolism a little kick in the butt from dieting for so long. And then we went down for another four and a half months or so. Yeah, three or four and a half months and got really, really super lean. And then I took the pictures and then that night I ate like two whole pizzas and a giant brownie and I was bloated for days. I looked like the yeah. Michelin man. It was sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, understandable. I mean, I love to eat two pizzas anytime, but I yeah. don't think it's like that. So it's it's tough when you go when you get that lean because then your body really just sucks in all the food that you eat. So then you get uncomfortably bloated and you're just like swollen up for a few days, just like so. <laughs> It was cool. It was a def I don't know if I'll be getting that lean anytime soon again, but it was really good experience to, to get like contest ready essentially. So it was fun. Yeah. I had a, it was tough, but it was fun. And I think it helps with um, consulting too. I think right. I mean, I don't know if you oh, consult yeah. with physique athletes or sports athletes specifically, but it helps I think to understand what an athlete's going through. For sure. You know, there's this weird thing going on right now, especially online, about there's kind of like the two groups where they're saying like coaches only or scientists only. And I think it's totally silly, first of all. But I think, you know, the people who tend to make the best coaches and consultants take that knowledge that they get from the science and their educational background, but also from their practical experiences and um, their more anecdotal evidence that they can fall back on. And so as a consultant, it's like, yeah, you, you know what they're going through, you know, maybe little mental tricks or things you can do to help alleviate some of the pain in the process. So it's, it's one of those things. It's hard to like tell someone to do something if you haven't done it once yourself. And I think even if you have knowledge, it's good to have that experience too when you're making programs for people, just so you know what they're going through. Cause otherwise you might not be able to relate. Yeah, definitely. That's what I think too. And um, can you tell us, did you use any special tricks or diet strategies to get that super lean? Because in the beginning, it's probably just lowering calories, I think. Is you know, that something you went all the way down? All, essentially, that's what you keep doing uh, all the way through. And so, you know, you also have to keep up your, your weight training. And so doing like high volume resistance training helps keep a lot of that muscle mass. Sometimes people think that they have to like go back to strength training during cut and it ends up just doing you a massive disservice you want to keep the reps high you want to make sure that your energy expenditure stays high uh and your strength's going to go in the toilet anyway at some point not always but at some point it's going to go down so it's kind of a, a, a you know futile at that point yeah. uh, but after that it's you know it's it's calorie restriction uh progressively it's increasing cardio keeping the weight training high i mean i was doing an unbelievable amount of cardio at that point i mean i would be doing my normal weight training and then one or even two sessions of cardio per day uh, which got to be really brutal and boring. I mean, you can only watch so much Justice League on Netflix before you start losing your mind. So, <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, I, I never watched that show, so I don't know if it's any oh. good or whatever. <laughs> I'm a big like Batman person, so yeah, for sure. Oh, really? it's, it yeah. helps pass the time when you're doing like walking cardio for, endlessly, but. But it's a cartoon, right? Justice League, what you're talking about, I think, right? Yeah, it's a cartoon yeah. based on the comic book stuff. So. Well, I, I mean, I'm maybe I shouldn't say cartoon, but I should say adult animation or whatever. But. No, oh, yeah, cartoon. <laughs> it was made for kids. I like to watch kids stuff. I'm not above okay. admitting that. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're on the same page. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I and uh, when you lose that much weight, there's you told us it's in you know it's inevitable to lose strength at a certain point but do you think that's uh because what i found is that your leverage has also changed quite a bit especially for bench pressing or for squatting i mean when i cut down weight my deadlift doesn't really suffer that much but my bench and goes down first then my squat and then then i don't want to cut down anymore is that something you experienced yourself too or did you have another experience uh, my similar, my experience was kind of the opposite of yours, uh, but what you experienced is totally normal. So for me, uh, I made some bad choices in what types of cardio that I was doing. And what I found is that the amount of volume that I was doing was really starting to stress my posterior chain muscles and my back muscles. So I actually took a really big hit in my deadlift, which came back once I started eating and training normally again, it absolutely came back. But for the time being, when I was cutting down, I definitely saw a big hit there. 
Whereas my squat stayed in the ball. I'm not a super strong squatter by any means, but you know, my squat hung around pretty well and my bench press, uh, like chest push movements hung around, but actually some other movements like my pulls, like upper body pulls, like doing pull-ups and stuff actually went up just because I ended up losing so much weight. Right. So then I was actually PRing on my pull-ups. Um, which makes sense. But yeah, so for me, it was like, uh, I, I usually am a fairly strong deadlifter, but that's where I ended up taking a big hit because I ended up doing so much volume of training, probably saw some muscle fiber conversion to their more fatigue resistant state, didn't have as many of those big type 2, type 2x muscle fibers, uh, just from all the training volume that I was doing. But the good news is, is that's very, very much reversible. Once you start eating normally again and take a little bit, bring your training volume down a little bit, your strength comes back and that's totally normal. And some people are really lucky and they can they can do cut phases and experience very, very minimal gain, uh, losses, I should say, in strength, whereas some of us are a little bit more sensitive and that's just a little inter-individual difference. But for me, it was it was the deadlift that got me. Bench press hung around, squat hung around pretty well up until the end. At the end, everything started to go down a little bit because I was just so tired. Um, but yeah, it was very similar, just maybe different, slightly different circumstance. Yeah, and do you think it's uh, important to shift goals when you're losing? Because you mentioned your pull-ups went up, and that might have been a nice mental break, right? I mean, like, oh, my deadlift's going down. Hey, but hey, my pull-ups are going up. Is that something you pay attention to? Yeah, well, at least to keep some perspective and not just be overly negative, right? Because when you're dieting, it's like your training volume's high, you're pissed off, you're hungry all the time, and then, you know, it's not uncommon to see strength go down. So it's good to keep some perspective and say, hey, I'm actually still doing pretty well on certain things. Even just maintaining strength when you're really, really getting exotically lean, that's a that's a big victory. So if you can still bench press for reps, what you are close to what you were doing before, that's a big win. You know, if you can do bent rows or pull-ups or even hitting PRs on some things, that's a huge psychological win. And it's, it's, it's good to keep that in context. I know for like powerlifting, you know, if we're not hitting the big weights for fives, threes, and singles on the main three lifts, it can be very discouraging. But at the same time, it's like, okay, you're still making progress. You're still doing well. And life's not all bad, you know. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. It's easy to be pissed when you're dieting. I think it's, it's most, that's the worst part is you're just always pissed. So it's good to stay positive and, and acknowledge the things you're doing well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And tell us a little bit more about your involvement with Renaissance Periodization then, because first you were a client, then you came on through Mike, I guess. And mm -hmm. uh, how do you work? Do you work as a team? Do you have group meetings, or is it uh, each coach has their individual? strengths and uh, maybe weaknesses Jeez. yeah so that's a great question so we actually all kind of have our own little niche areas so my background is in more like field sport athletics uh, like a lot of concurrent training stuff so i've always worked with things like rugby football uh, soccer those types of sports whereas like mike is more on the bodybuilding powerlifting side and then we have other people who do like weightlifting or other sports like that so largely we all kind of operate as individuals but we consult with each other constantly on everything so when people have crossfit clients and they say hey i need some advice on how to do my you know competition day prep we all get involved. I like to make little cheat sheets for myself and then I share them with everyone else and say, hey, here's something I did for a CrossFit or here's something I did for weightlifting. Feel free to use it. And so it's nice that we all, you know, we, we, we all know each other and we all have a good educational background. So uh, it's really cool to be able to, to lean on other people and say, hey, what do you think about this? I have this issue. How did you do it? And I'll tell you what, what's really nice is actually just the from a consulting standpoint, just getting other people's opinions because you start to see some wacky stuff. People start to email you some crazy stuff every now and again, and you're like, I don't, I don't know how to deal with this. And so we, we like somebody like Nick Shaw, who is this, you know, the CEO of RP, is really great with dealing with situations and making sure to answer things very politically correctly. And you know, and it's, it's easy to like to to slip up every now and again. So it's nice yeah. to have all these other people that we can lean on and say, hey, you have expertise in all these various areas and let's all work together and make the best products that we can. So it's really cool. So I, you know, I came on and so I ended up adopting a lot of the CrossFit people just because of my background with a lot of the concurrent training stuff. So I, my, most of my clients are usually CrossFit or I get a lot of the rugby ones just because I'm the default rugby guy. But, uh, and so that's kind of where I'm at now. I do a lot of the training. I do a lot of the nutrition consultation and it's really cool. I'm really like thankful. I got to, got to meet Mike and be a part of this whole thing. It's been a really great experience. Yeah, very nice. Uh, and for me, the most interesting thing is 
training for sports like field sports because training for bodybuilding or powerlifting in fact it's it's pretty easy right i mean for power straightforward right <laughs> sorry more straightforward right it's like okay get strong check exactly exactly and you only do one bodybuilding show once every six months uh, same with powerlifting but when you're in field sports you basically have a competition every weekend and yeah you have a lot of different nutritional demands um how does that impact your work or how does how do you work with that not just with training but also with nutrition and how do you deal with because lots of rugby players or soccer players probably have a strength training coach or program they are put on by the rugby coach or whatever how do you deal with that situation yeah it can be complicated because you know as if you're just doing consulting work you get individuals you're not managing a whole team right so it's not always the same and so you always just have to make sure you know their schedule so like when are they competing when are they not competing and then you can start to make an outline or what we like to call an annual plan throughout the year right and so with the annual plan we'll know when they're doing certain things are they training for hypertrophy are they training for strength are they doing power are they competing and then we can start to map out their nutritional and training goals within each of those phases. So if we're talking nutrition, generally we don't want to make any major body, comp body compositional changes for most athletes uh, around the competition time. We want to do that away from competition and get that sorted out. So if we want them to gain a lot of muscle mass or if we want them to lose a lot of fat, that's something we would start to work on in the general preparatory phase, which is usually the one that's furthest away from training. And as they get closer and closer to composition, we, uh, competition, we want their body weight to stabilize and so they're nice and comfortable going into whatever they're doing. You know, if you're trying to cut them into a competition, if you're dealing with a lot of fatigue factors, they might not be able to train at the same volumes or intensities and they're adapt, therefore adapt less. Their performance is going to suffer. Same thing with mass, ironically. If you have them doing a mass phase, they might actually be too big or too heavy for their anthropometrical standards for competition, right? So if you have a sprinter and you want to get them much stronger so they can sprint faster, that's a great idea. But if they're like too heavy, that's going to be reflective on their sprint times, right? So you got to make sure that they're within their body weight and anthro norms for competition too. So it gets complicated. It's fun though. I, that's something I like to work on a lot. So it's really one of the things that was really rewarding for me was when I was the rugby coach at ETSU, I was able to do their sport practice, their strength conditioning, and for a couple of them, I was able to do their nutrition at the same time as well. So I got to manage everything. I was the control freak for that for that group. Uh, and it yeah, gets but annoying. That's when you can make stuff happen, right? For sure, you can make a lot of cool things happen. You know, it's hard when it's when it's you and two or three other people all working with the same person who may not agree with what you're saying. And I've had that happen plenty of times where I said, "Hey, let's work on this," and they say no. Um, and then you have to compromise, and you have to you have to come to something mutually agreeable because you're working with other people. But yeah, so when you can manage all the things, when you have the control, you can start to see like people really make big changes. One of the kids I used to train, uh, Andy Dedevo, uh, he's tried out for the USA national team a couple times, or one, not a couple times, this year. Um, and it's just cool to see someone going from their like sophomore to senior year, and it's like night and day, they're like another human being. Even on the field, you watch them play, and you're like, wow, you are a different person. And I think that's like what I find to be very rewarding. I can imagine. I, I really can imagine, yeah. And let's talk about the book a little bit, uh, about scientific principles of strength training. Mike used to pronounce or announce it as the powerlifting book. It became a little bit more than that. Can you tell us a little bit about the writing process or how, 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 it, how you all three, because Chad Wesley Smith was also involved. Yeah. How, do you, how, how did that go or how did it come together? For sure, yeah. So Mike did the the bulk of the re, uh, writing, and so Mike would send out drafts. So I got a couple drafts. Uh, when we first started off, I was doing all the citations and sourcing, and just giving initial read throughs. And then eventually, Mike had done some more editing on his own, and he started sending out some more large final copies of what we were looking at. And so you know, Chad and I both made a lot of edits throughout the book. And one of the things that I wanted to convey was after reading the first couple drafts of the book I, I said we can't just call this a powerlifting book we have to change the name it really under undermines all the things that we're talking about and so we we came up with the, the current title the you know science uh, uh, I, I already forgot what it's called shoot yeah but it's, it's 
too difficult even for literate people like you. So <laughs> yeah. how the hell are we supposed to understand what's it about, man? Yeah, and so like what, what I wanted to say is, you know, this book conveys uh, the scientific training principles. We're not just talking about powerlifting. We're talking about the training principles in the context of powerlifting. And so Chad, Mike, and uh, Nick all agreed, and we, we came up with the title, and I think it came out really well. And so, um, you know, then we had some really thorough editing. I think I gave Mike over 200 comments and well over a bunch of track changes. And we, we ended up going back and forth even after that, and I, and I think Chad did as well. So, um you know, kudos to Mike because he, he, Mike wrote the book and, you know, I, he, he relied on us to get feedback and make sure we were conveying concepts clearly. And one thing that I think that turned out really, really well, and it's something that Mike and I have been shooting around for a long time is the concept of, we call it MRV in the book, which is maximal recoverable volume. And I really like, I want to give Mike the thumbs up because that's a, a term that he kind of coined for something that we all knew as scientists intuitively, but there was no terminology to describe that. And so Mike came up with this term and it ends up explaining a lot of the concepts that we're trying to convey really, really well. And so that was a part of the book that I think turned out really awesome. And for powerlifting, it's a little bit more straightforward. You can look at MRV in other sports too, like rugby or soccer. And now you've got a lot of things to think about. You got weight training, you got sport practice, you got contacts, how many times are you getting hit? You got conditioning, speed work, you got a lot of stuff to think about. So I think that was one of the really cool parts of the book and I was glad that I could give my, my feedback on that and it turned out really awesome. Yeah, I think the book turned out really great too. I mean, it's, uh, it's almost 400 pages, 370 pages or something and it's really the kind of book I like to read because, you know, once you're, when I talked to Mike, he basically, he said something, you know, if something works or if something doesn't work, doesn't matter, but I want to know why. And if I don't know why, then I'm just freaking out because I don't know what I'm doing. And yeah. I, I, it's the, I felt the same way. And I think this book really helps people understand what's going on with training and how to put their training programs together. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And one thing we want to keep in mind too, and this is something I teach in my classes a lot, is there's a lot of different training programs out there, right? And you get people who have all these great results. But the thing that we find the most is that when you have somebody who is relatively untrained and they start a training program, they get phenomenal results no matter what it is. And so you might do, and I'm not, and this is not meant to sound insulting to any of these, but you might do CrossFit, you might do 531, you might do P90X, you might do like Insanity Workout Tape, you might do like the super awesome James Hoffman program. Uh, but at the end of the day, like if you're relatively new, um, you're going to see great results across the board. So what we try to tell people is like that doesn't necessarily validate, it doesn't give efficacy to those programs when people are new. And so we want to understand why certain things happen. We want to understand the fundamentals of the training process. And then we can start really critically analyzing different programs and say, okay, what does this program do really well? Or maybe it doesn't do quite as well. Can I modify this existing program to maybe be a little bit better based on the science and underlying characteristics that we know? And so I think that's really important because you see like, you know, it's, it's very common for coaches to say like, oh, I had this guy and he got like a you know, double his squat strength in X number of months. Well, okay, he was probably a noob, first of all, right? And we see that kind of stuff all the time. So we just want to keep in mind, like, you know, when you're working with untrained people, it doesn't necessarily provide efficacy for your program. The ones that really are good are the ones where we see that long-term growth and use a lot of the available science and literature on the topics. So, so, so yeah, but so you had a whole long story just now, but you... Yeah. And in the book, there's no programs, there's just principles. But apparently, there is a super James Hoffman program, which is the best. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to think it's the best, but, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, and people respond differently. Like, sometimes I write programs for people, and sometimes you get people who are gigantic responders, and sometimes you get people who are not as responsive. And so it's just important to, like, again, understand what you're doing, and then you can make modifications as we go, right? So I talked about MRV, and it's like, okay, well, if I'm giving one person a program and I'm giving somebody else the same program and they're responding differently, they probably both are working within different levels of MRV, right? So I have to adapt that for those individuals accordingly. But, you know, I'd like to think that I'm pretty good at programming. I like to, <laughs> you know, well, maybe. I, maybe, maybe. Maybe. At least you have the body shots for it, so, yeah. you know, you <laughs> shoot, so you're a proper fitness guy now. 
That's right. I can validate with photo shoots. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, it is what is happening a lot, right? I mean, there's this huge oh, big yeah. guys that 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 are basically like, look at me. I have abs. I have enormous chests and arms. Do my thing. Buy my program. Uh, buy my whatever. You know what? I'm all about like freedom and people taking advantage of those opportunities. So if you look good and you can market yourself and you can sell programs, like by all means do it. But we just want the consumer to be like aware of what they're buying, right? So if you're just buying a program because the guy has the great looking abs and you know giant guns and nice packs, like you might not be getting the best product. Like at least you know with with RP we uh we we all walk the walk and we have you know a really strong educational background and I think that's kind of like our big selling point. Um, but yeah, it's not unusual to see people who are clients themselves, not necessarily of RP, but they'll they'll start a diet program and then a month later they'll start posting pics and say, oh yeah, tra you know, programs available, Facebook me, you know, <laughs> it's like yeah. well, you, you just started, you don't yeah, even know and, what you're doing. Exactly, and plus, you know, the program that they did or the diet strategies they did worked for them, right? I mean, I know, you know, lowering calories works for everybody, but there's more, at least in my opinion, more to coaching than just the strength training program and the nutrition program because anybody can set that up. It's more about making the individual changes and there's more to take in account than just volume and calories. I mean, there's lifestyle factors, I mean, does the guy work 24-7 or whatever, right? And I think yeah. that's where a coach can shine, basically. Yeah, so like uh, my, my dissertation advisor, Brad DeWeese made a really good point and he said, you know, coaching is actually the art form, right? But we, we take the evidence-based practice and we give it to the coach and they turn it into the art of coaching, getting people to comply, getting them to be successful with all this great knowledge that you're providing with them. And that's really hard. And so, uh, you know, I've kind of, I haven't been doing as much of that where I'm actually, I've done a lot more online stuff lately. I haven't done as much like one-on-one -on -one as much as I'd like to. But once the fall kicks up, I'll be back with rugby and I'll be able to do that again. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I think being able to get persons to buy into what you're doing is is equally important, right? Uh, so I actually had a, I had, I had a client who came to me, she said, I want to lose weight, wrote her a program, wasn't losing weight, restricted calories, still wasn't losing weight. Got back to her and I was like, how long have you been dieting? And she told me about like six months or so. And to me, that was like, bing, duh. And so I gave her a maintenance program, so basically more food, and then just started losing weight like crazy, right? So at that point, it's like you have to know, like, okay, constricting this person anymore is not going to do anything. You actually have to give them more food because they've been dieting for so long. It just becomes an effort in futility. And so that was one of those cool examples where you can use that knowledge and your coaching skills to figure out what you need to do, and then this person continued to lose weight after a couple cut phases, maintenance phases, cut phases, and she's doing really well. So an example of something like that where you have to you have to know how to use your skills. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Really awesome. Yeah, because that's not that's something people uh, tend to forget, right? Uh, especially now with the with the big internet. It's uh everything's out there. I mean good things and the bad things, but even the good things are maybe not the best things for you right now and you know that's where where a company like renaissance prioritization can come in or that company i'm involved with read by science so yeah definitely right on i really like your website by the way thanks oh you took a look <laughs> yeah for sure i was watching thanks. the mike interview for a little while and I like the part where he is having trouble with his microphone. That's very traditional Mike <laughs> Isretel style. Oh, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> to be honest, I mean, uh, it, it, <laughs> I feel, I felt really bad for, for Mike basically because it was the second time I interviewed him because I did it one week before and the whole recording got scrambled. I mean, I couldn't. Oh, no. Yeah. So, but Mike was kind enough to do it again. So we did it again and then. First, we had some mic troubles, then my webcam died, so we needed to restart another recording. <laughs> I had to video edit everything together, but this one's going so far so, so, good. Far, so fingers, good. Yeah, fingers crossed, man. <laughs> my, my cat is trolling me as we speak. He's, you can't see him, but he's like waiting to jump on the computer because he wants to eat really bad, so I'm, I'm yeah. waiting for him. Any minute's going to jump oh, up. And he wants to eat or he just want to see some cat pictures on the internet that everybody has, has been ah. posting. I, I put him on my Instagram account, but he just wants to eat right now because it's it's almost yeah. dinner time. But he's on a diet too. He's on the Renaissance Kitty diet because he's a little overweight. So <laughs> oh, you're starting a new niche there, rugby yeah. and, and kitties. 
Kitties, yeah, I can't help it. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, he's coming. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> man. So, yeah, I really like your website. It's really cool. It's nice that you can get some like really good credible sources on there and talk about powerlifting. Powerlifting is such a funny one because like it's so straightforward, it's so simple, right? Trying to get as maximally strong as you can, but there's all these different people like hating on each other and talking trash, and it's incredible. Yeah. I I just don't get it. I mean, I'm not a powerlifter full disclosure, but I just, you know, I, I watch the community and it's like, everyone's always talking trash and butting heads about methodology and it's crazy. Yeah. And, uh, well that, and that's actually one of the reasons I, I started the website and because I just started, so I have to put out my own content and I, I don't mind because I think it's okay and it's good. You know, I think it's good, but I really want it to be like the hub of powerlifting. Like you say, I mean, I basically don't care. I, no, let me put it differently. I care what Louis Simmons says because the guy knows his shit. I care what Dan Green's doing because he knows his shit. I care what the Russians or the Norwegians or Renaissance Periodization or what everybody's doing who's getting great results. And basically, it seems to me that people are taking, you know, no, you have to do conjugate method. No, you have to do what the Russians do or whatever. And, you know, fuck that, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's that's, that's again, like, so it comes down to, like, are you just looking at these training programs to look at them, or are you really trying to understand them? And I think that's where somebody like you can really help people and say, like, hey, let's actually break this down a little bit more critically. Why are they having success over in Russia? Why are they having success over at Westside? Why are they having success over at Boss? Well, maybe they all overlap in some areas, but they're different in others. So Exactly, exactly. And that's why I love, you know, talking to people like you and uh, like Mike like crack knuckles and I hope I can get more people on that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, let's get back to, let's say Renaissance periodization. You mm -hmm. have now like 10 consultants, right? Yeah. Actually, so, I think so. Yeah. yeah that's a lot. Uh, but how, you know, how, how did that, were they all clients and then they came to Renaissance because they had all good results and same background or because that's a lot of people, man. I think, yeah, I think a, a handful of us started off as clients or, or, you know, or at least had worked with Mike in some capacity, like myself, for sure. I know uh, Mel was in a similar boat. Um, but, you know, a lot of it ends up just being uh, kind of like the friends, of, I don't want to say friends, but like friends and colleagues of Mike Ezra Tell. So he's gone all over the place and he's met really great people. And so like when Mike went to Missouri, he got hooked up with Dr. Goddard and Dr. Jen Case, right, who are also very qualified. So that those were people that he met as a result of uh, his job in academia. And so they came on board. We've had other people like um, Derek Wilcox and Christian Carter who were familiar with Mike from either personal experience or through school. And so they got involved. Um, some of the some other people I'm not as familiar with, uh, so I can't really speak for them. But I know a lot of us just either knew Mike and or Nick in some capacity, whether it was as clients or as colleagues and friends. And we all kind of have the same passion for either nutrition or training or both. And so we all came together and it works really awesome. You know, it's really cool, especially like for me, sometimes I'll get something where somebody might email me and they, they might have a, a metabolic disorder or something. And I might have to say like, hey, Jen, like, what do you think? And she'll, she'll go, we'll go back and forth and she'll give an answer or something like that. So it ends up working really, really well. And I, I really enjoy those people who I work with. Awesome. And how, how, where does your fascination with strength training come from? Because you're doctor in science and exercise, it's called, right? Yeah, strength exercise is sports science. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I've always I've always been like I started lifting weights when I was in middle school. My dad got me involved and it was just something for me that just became part of my life. It's not something that I, I really think about. It's just something that I've always done and I've always uh, treated very passionately. And then getting my education was really awesome because now I was I'm able to take all that information and put it in my, my personal life or with my friends and family. So I've, I've been a lifelong athlete. I played I did American football. I've done uh, wrestling, rugby, I've done martial arts. So Strength training was always a big part of those sports. Like you, very rarely that you'll see a rugby player who's not strong. So good luck. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just it's just something that's fused into my life. You know, a lot of people still have to make an effort to to include resistance training and strength training in their life. For me, it's just it's already it's been there. It's always there, and it's never going away. So I've always yeah. liked it. I like to preach the gospel of strength with my students. You know, we take a lot of the lessons we learned from Dr. Stone about strength being 
basically the foundational fitness characteristic of all sports yeah. and passing that along to a new new generations of future strength coaches, future personal trainers and exercise scientists. Cool. So, that, and how, how familiar are your students with Renaissance supervision with you and Mike? Because you and Mike used to give call, uh, class at the same college, right? Because Mike's moved to Philadelphia, I think. So yeah, I, I've lived in Philadelphia for the last year, and then Mike's coming to Philadelphia uh, over this summer. So we'll be working in the oh. same institution this upcoming year, which is really awesome. Mike's one of my best friends, and so we went to school together. Then we split apart for a little while. Uh, now we're coming back together. I'm, I'm sorry, James. That uh, now it becomes a little bit awkward. You just said Mike's your best friend, and I talked to Mike, and he, well, he said I was his best friend. And oh, Mike. So. Okay, so Mike uses the term best friend. Uh, not exclusively. He has multiple best friends for different oh. different purposes. Oh, it's so, like that. It's like that. So don't put you know too much James? stock into it. You know what? You're my <laughs> you best friend right now. So I'm down. You're my best web chat friend for sure. Yeah, for for at least the last forty minutes, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So him and I are actually yeah he, we're actually moving into an apartment together in Philadelphia uh, in the next month or so, and he's going to be teaching at Temple. And I think Mike's students are really familiar with uh, RP. I think they just they just I don't think he, he like pitches it to him. I think they just find out about it because they really like him. And yeah. they, they find out that he's involved in this, and then they, they kind of get involved, and it's really good. I've had a similar situation. I've had students say, hey, I checked out your diet book, or hey, I checked out the training book. And that's really awesome. It's really rewarding. We don't like, we don't, we're not like spewing RP while we're at work. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. a little conflict of interest. But um, yeah. So, yeah, some students do find out about it, and they get really excited and uh, have more than a few who picked up the diet book. Actually, I was so I've been running around Philadelphia and New Jersey chasing down summer interns. So I do all the strength conditioning internships for Temple Exercise Science, and so got to meet all these different internship site coordinators at like Villanova or at some other schools or some private schools. And I usually just threw out my business card, and every now and again somebody'd be like, "Oh, hey, RP," and I'd be like, "Yep, that's us." So, <laughs> yeah, well, and that's what I was going to ask, basically, because you know everybody's on the internet and. Well, I'm not sure because maybe I'm just in the information bubble, but RP is doing really good stuff and they're really out there, uh, at least Mike is, and he has a huge following. So I would imagine that that would have a, certainly it would have an impact on on uh, people listening to your classes maybe or, you know, taking it more seriously because you're not just a scientist or a teacher or a professor, but you actually lift. Um, and you I can imagine. walk a little bit, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I think what Mike and I are, are we're, at Temple, we're kind of in the in the middle of doing some curriculum revision, and so Mike's going to be a big integral part of that. And I hope we can bring some of the attention that we've gotten through RP to Temple University and say, hey, do you want to if you want to be an exercise or sports science student, like this is the place to be. We got two really great names. We're probably going to bring in even more. So if your goal is to be a strength coach or work in human performance, like this is a good place to come study. Like you get to be in a big city work with some cool people. Uh, one of the things that we've been throwing around is potentially having an accelerated master's program at some point. That's not something we have ready to go, but it's something that we're throwing around, and I think Mike's going to be a big part of that. And so, yeah, we want to take some of the attention we've gotten from RP and also bring it into academia and say we want to produce kids who are really good. We want people to come out of college prepared to have the skills and knowledge they need to be good strength coaches, to be good personal trainers, to be good cardiac rehab specialists, whatever you want to be, we want to provide you that knowledge and that hands-on skills. So we want to take, you know, both our jobs and kind of bring them together in some ways. Yeah, that sounds awesome, especially, you know, if you can bring your passion or, well, <laughs> it, it's obviously your passion anyway, but you know, it's it's more than just your work. You know, it's even your passion outside your work, and you're being really involved outside your work. I mean, it, it can be your passion outside of your work, and you could just be lifting, but you're actually doing more work outside of your work. You know, if you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, for sure, it's everything. I mean, it's everything to us. There's not a day that goes by where we don't sit around thinking about this stuff in our free time. You know, a lot of people will sit around and play PlayStation. I play PlayStation too. I'm not trying to say I'm above that. But, uh, you know, a lot, we spent a lot of time, like, trying to figure out how to make things better or trying to understand these things a little bit further. And so, you know, the thing is, with science is a slow process. We get a couple articles, you know, every a couple times a month or maybe one or two really big ones a year. 
Uh, but it's hard to, to base any real strong opinions on one single article, so we have to wait for review articles and meta-analyses and new textbooks to come out. So it's an ongoing, it's a lifelong process for us, right? We're always looking for more information or being more critical of things as they come out. And it's just, it's, it's fused within our lives. It's just, we, we never get away from it. It's every day, it's all day, you know? You, you actually touch upon a, uh, a cool topic right there because you mentioned science papers, uh, reading them, having to wait for them to be reviewed, peer reviewed, new yeah. science papers, whatever. And that is a slow process to gain new insights. Now the trend is basically, you know, grabbing a science paper, maybe three, whatever, and then basing your whole ideology around it or, you know, throwing something else in the bin because it has been published in 1999 and that's been, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah. So it can't be relevant anymore. Do you keep up with every science or with a lot of science or do you pay yeah. attention to changing papers? You you make a really awesome point. And so this is something we see a lot on the internet where somebody will have a point that they're trying to make and they'll say, well, here's this paper that supports my point, right? But we want to keep in mind that we can't really put too much stock into any one single science paper, right? I can find a paper that says, you know, strength training makes you weaker. And that's probably out there, right? There's thousands and thousands of papers out there. And so, you know, it's not a bad place to start. So, you know, people going towards the literature to, to try and support their position, that's a great place to start. But we just can't put too much stock into one paper. And so what we usually recommend is, you know, try to find a review article. Try to find an, a meta-analysis, which is a conglomeration of multiple studies, uh, on the topic before you really start formulating an opinion because one or two papers can say just about anything unfortunately and that's that is a flaw in science but those papers start to accumulate and when those review papers and meta-analyses comes out we can start to get a more clear understanding of the topic and we can start filtering out okay what things worked what things didn't work or what were some confounders right and so yeah going to the literature is great we just want to make sure that we're reading it critically and also, you know, science, scientific papers, and this is not meant to sound insulting, but, you know, they're, they're not necessarily made for lay persons to read. And so what we end up seeing sometimes, and I, I know that sounds mean, but I'm not trying to be mean, uh, is people will read an article and they'll, they'll look at the abstract or they'll look at one line in the conclusion and say, oh, this proves my point. But then they miss some of the gross big picture items that, you know, somebody with a little bit more keen eye would see. So, uh, sorry, I, I'm tangenting a little bit, but yeah, so... To answer your other question, yeah, we, we, we try to keep up on the science, right? So if you're looking at stuff from the 2000s and earlier, it might be time to, to revamp of what you've looked at. If you haven't looked at that topic in a while, it's probably good to go back and keep up with it. I know for myself, I keep a little PubMed ticker search engine, so I get email updates whenever there's a few hot words that pop into the literature. That way, it, it helps keep me up to date. Um, but yeah, you can't you can't rely on the information that you had from 20 years ago. Unfortunately, we we have technological advances. We've had methodological advances which help move science along, and we've learned new things. Even within the last 10 years, we've started to figure out like the intensity thresholds for driving intracellular signaling pathways. That's something we had no idea about, you know, 20 years ago. Now we have a, a much stronger understanding of how some of that stuff works. Do we know everything? Absolutely not. But we're we're getting there. So yeah, you gotta stay up to date and it's it's work. It's it's not you don't just you can't just go on a blog and say, okay, there's one paper and now I know everything about nutrition or now I know everything about strength training, right? So that's where like the review articles, the meta-analyses like come in handy and they say, Hey, this is a refresher in this topic if you haven't been up to date in a little while. Yeah, I that I, I think that's a good point you're touching upon there. Yeah, definitely. Um well, I think we got it almost. Uh, one, more. I have one question, or yeah. maybe three. What are your <laughs> top three metal albums? Because my men, outside of Slippery When Wet. <laughs> okay, that that hardly counts. So the ones that I really like, uh, Agaloc, The Mantle. That's one of the most brutal, like depressing albums I've ever heard in my life. Really good. Uh, I like you even more now. <laughs> yeah. I really liked uh, Novambra, The Blue was really good. That's probably up there in my top three. And then another one, ooh, this might be hard. I'm gonna go a different route and I'm gonna go say Typo Negative, October Rust. That's awesome too, yeah, it definitely so I, is. I spanned, the, I spanned a pretty good spectrum there. Of, yeah, of you did. Yeah, but you named the right spectrum because some people say, oh, my favorite metal album is from 
what's that band called? I don't even know. The the new new metal. Oh, and I yeah. think about metal, you know, Cannibal Corpse, that's metal, Morbid Angel, that's metal, Suffocation, yeah. that's metal. You know, we were kind of in a metal funk the last couple of years, but then like a couple of good albums came out. Like the new Atlas Moth was really good. The new Behemoth was surprisingly yeah. good. Um, the new Insomnium was really good. Some of the other big ones, like the new, the latest Opeths were kind of, eh. the latest <laughs> in Flames were like, eh. uh-huh. <laughs> I really like, uh, I really like Amorphous, but their last couple were kind of, uh, so some of the, like the big, the big names haven't been putting out some like the, the best albums lately, but some other bands have come out in like 2014, 2015, which were like just totally awesome. So it was a nice little resurgence of, of metal back into the scene. Yeah, exactly. I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more offline. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was great having you on, James. Really, I th- thanks for your time, for taking yeah. time out of your day. And, Thank you for having you know, me. No problem. It was a real pleasure, and I uh, hope to see more of your work very soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you.